Yeah, we're taking care of some administrative matters at the top of the sports bank zone. Vincentian Keith Joseph, a long-standing sports administrator, is eyeing the Panam region's top job, president of Panam Sports. And he'll have his chance when voting takes place at the 62nd Annual General Assembly next Wednesday and Thursday at the Carnival Convention Center in Paraguay. Panam Sports represents the current 41 National Olympic Committees of the Americas, which includes those that fall under the Caribbean Association of National Olympic Committees, CANOC, of which Joseph is the president. He's also the second vice president of Panam Sports, and to become the boss, he must unseat the man in charge since 2017, Chile's Nevin Illich. Keith joins us now via Zoom to discuss his plans for the organization and how his appointment could benefit the Caribbean region, which has six other members vying for positions, by the way. Keith Joseph joins us on the Sportsmax Zone. Good afternoon, Mr. Joseph. First of all, how do we find you today? I'm always good. That, that, that's one philosophy that I've always had. I, I think it, it, it is um, something that, that allows me to go through each day. Uh, with a certain measure of calm and, and, and uh, allows me to do the work that I need to do uh, um, appropriately. Yeah, last time out, we thought you would run for this position. Um, everything seemed set, and then you withdrew from the process. What's different this time around? You know, in, 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 in 2017, when we considered it, um, we found ourselves with three members of CANOC uh, contesting for the position, and two from from Consudatli, the, the from um, the or the Sur, the South American grouping. So it was Richard Peterkin, an an IOC member who was from uh, San Lucia. He was the incumbent treasurer. It was Jose Joaquin Pueyo of the Dominican Republic who was a former member, long-serving member, uh, president of the Central American and Caribbean Sports Organization, and myself. And we thought that, you know, um, look, this is going to be uh, a case of significant attrition. And so we looked at, at the scenario and we said, well, maybe we should all decide that in the interest of Caribbean unity and a display of Caribbean unity, that we um, agree on the individual we thought would have had the best chance at the time. We thought it would have been Dr. Jose Joaquin Pueyo, and we faltered by one vote. What do you think is different this time around? Do you think that you are in a better position um, to beat Illich? I, I, I think I am. Um, I, I think that um, having served the region um, as president of CANOC, I think having served the region in other um, areas in terms of um, athletics, I think in terms of my position as second vice president of Panam Sports, um, originally third vice, vice president, but then eventually second vice president. Um, and I've been on the Canuck executive as vice president since 2012. I think that gives me a wealth of experience, um, and it allows me to be able to engage in a kind of, of critical analysis of our performances over the years, enough to suggest that the time has come for a change. I think we are at a point in global sport where changes are required, um, and you know the, the outgoing IOC president, Thomas Bass, said when he came to office in 2013, his mantra was change or be changed. And I think we are at that stage yet again, but this time in the Americas. Yeah, you've sat as the second vice president for, what, the last four years? The last, the, I've been on, on panel post as a vice president since 2012. Mm. I started off as third vice president, and during the last four years, uh, one of the vice presidents had to limit office, and uh, subsequently I was moved up to that position of second vice president. Yeah, this is a two-in-one question. What have you seen under the leadership of Nevin Illich from um, Chile um, that you think you can significantly improve on? And if you are voted in as Panam Sports president, how do you think the Caribbean region specifically, of course, um, the entire Panam region, but 
specifically the Caribbean region, can benefit from your position as president if it turns out to be that way? The fundamental pillars of my, of my uh, bid for the presidency um, are fourfold. First, I think that we need to restore trust. I think that we have lost confidence in the, the, um, in the organization and the leadership of the organization so that um, there has been a loss of transparency, there has been a loss of accountability on the part of the organization. We've just held the Pan American Games in Chile in, in 2023. Uh, there were a number of issues there that reflected the state of the organization. You may recall that there were complaints from the USA and Canada, Brazil, uh, even Barbados, about the state of the of readiness of the village in which they were located. Uh, the, one of the venues, uh, the, the, the um, uh, handball venue, I think it was, for a qualifying a tournament for the Olympics, had tremendous difficulties in terms of its roofing. I think that the, one of the problems was that uh, Nevin, as, as president of Pan Am Sports, uh, and also Chilean, perhaps may have inadvertently spent much of his time trying to ensure that the games were what he wanted more as a Chilean than what it should have been for the Americas. I think that that um, we were not sufficiently involved in what was happening. Uh, we were not sufficiently transparent in terms of communicating with all of our members as to the true state of affairs um, of the level of preparation. I think the games could have been significantly better as a result of that. I think our communication um, has not been the very best. Um, if we have, uh, have problems in terms of, of of even the issue of employment. Uh, the staff, for example, we are member, 41 member organization. And we have one person from the Caribbean employed, one person. And that may well have to do with the fact that employment opportunities within the organization are not canvassed from the membership. So that very often the members, if you were to ask your colleagues, even in Jamaica, uh, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, to what extent are they aware of the opportunities for employment for individuals in sport who see sport as a career pathway? Um, where are they going? And an opportunity exists and you suddenly realize that somebody else has been employed or some other persons have been employed. You didn't hear anything about the employment. I think also that uh, for us, the issue of unity is particularly important. We're a multicultural, uh, cosmopolitan region. But the, re the, the, the reflection of the leadership doesn't always um, resonate well with a unified body. In sport, we love to talk about how we are a family. But that is not borne out on the field of play. It is not borne out even at the administrative level in many of our sporting organizations. And that's not restricted to the Americas. We've seen that in football across the world. We've seen it, uh, the level of discrimination in, in the case of Casta Semenya, for example, where we go into the realm of gender. We as a region need to understand that we can put aside our differences of language, of ethnicity, of race, of status, of class, in order to facilitate a harmonization of our efforts, really, to do what Mandela was able to tell us. Sport changes lives, but sports also changes society. And we need to be able to do that by unifying um, our region. I know that within the Caribbean, we have challenges with unifying ourselves as a region, but we continue to work on that. And I believe that we can achieve it um, under my leadership in Panama Sports. I also believe that our, our governance structures are a bit out of date. Um, and I think that you witnessed that the IOC continued attempts at trying to modernize the governance structures. I don't think that they have done it perfectly, and neither have we. But I believe that we have a capacity to do better in terms of ensuring higher levels of engagement of members of our societies who have the requisite skills, who have the requisite expertise, and who are willing to contribute to the broader development process of us in the Americas. I also believe that we have had, um, we have opportunities to reform the organization, which is the, the third pillar, to ensure that we can 
uh, engage more people in the decision-making processes. We, yes, we have at least commissions, but are they really making an impact? Are they allowed to participate in the decision-making process? Are we doing the best with regard to, to what we put on offer for the athletes who we claim consistently are the reasons we are in this business? My fourth pillar has to do with growth, growth and development. Um, expanding youth participation, giving them an opportunity to really help shape what is happening. I was in a conversation recently where people were saying, you know, um, we, we, we are talking about changes and the highest level of change that we are witnessing within sport is coming from the new sports. Traditional sports in the Olympic movement are constantly being challenged by new sports that are emerging. What is the difference? They are more appealing to you. They are more responsive to the use of today. They are more in sync with what today's generation and tomorrow's generation are interested in. Are we up to that yet? Not certain that we are anywhere near there. So, so generally, I believe that if we work on these four pillars, uh -huh. that we make a difference. You're, you're deciding to run on a platform of transparency. So let's start off. Uh, with that um, this afternoon, because earlier this year, Peru, Lima, Peru, they were awarded the, the Pan Am Games of 2027. It was taken from Barranquilla out of uh, Colombia. Uh, they did not meet a few contractual um, obligations, according to the release sent out. Um, in the spirit of transparency, because we haven't heard of the reasons, why did they lose the games? The arrangement that was made with, with uh, Barranquilla was that, uh, and, and with any host, is that they, once they have won the bid, they, uh, they have to sign a host city contract. Uh, there was some time taken to get that contract signed. But once it was signed, it meant that you have certain obligations to meet on an annual basis. It was felt that uh, Colombia took too long to respond first to meeting any of the initial commitments. What, what, um, kind of, the, what kind of obligations? Were there any financial obligations that they had to meet? Their financial obligation, because there's a cost associated with hosting the games. Right. So you are expected on a, uh, for the period leading up to the games to facilitate somewhere in the vicinity of 3.3 million US dollars per year in terms of your contribution to uh, it's, it's associated with the rights, the gaining the rights to host the games. Were all members of the board comfortable with the decision to strip a Baron Kia from hosting the, the games? Well, I think <laughs> that is an internal issue with regard to the decision-making well, process. Uh, what, right, what were, were you comfortable, end, were you the, comfortable with it? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the decision was made by the collective. It's like, like cabinet and government. You have to accept that a majority uh, would have uh, taken that stance to allow for uh, a removal of Baron Kia. Baron Kia was given um, several opportunities. They felt that they were uh, putting different options on the table. And the executive felt at the time that um, they were changing or slightly moving the goalposts at the time and were not sufficiently comfortable with what was being offered. But were you comfortable with the decision made by the board? Were you on board with the final decision, sir? <laughs> That's a challenging question. The thing is that I, I, I prefer to remain, um, you know, consistent with the, the, the collective responsibility that the board had. All right. So I was just following your template of transparency, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, in regards to a Caribbean man or person not being in charge of uh, this, this, this uh, body, why, why do you think it is time now for, for you to come into um, that position? And uh, what, what's the difference this time around, in your opinion? The sense of us paying our dues is, is important. At the beginning, one could have understood that many of the Caribbean countries, this was 1948 when the organization was started, many Caribbean countries did not even have independence and did not have uh, national Olympic committees. Um, some got on board in the 1940s, some in the 1950s, then in the 1960s, um, when we had, in the late 50s, when we had the West Indies Federation or West Indies 
um, Olympic Committee was established and we participated in the Pan Am Games in 1959 um, in, in, in Chicago uh, as, a, as a collective grouping, West Indies. And we did also compete in the 1960 Olympics in Rome as a, a West Indies Olympic Committee. And then once independence started in the 1960s with Jamaica in August and Trinidad and Tobago later in that same month, um, we moved towards national Olympic committees in a way in which we were now able to expand ourselves and, and become members of the Central American and Caribbean Sport Organization and the Pan Am Sports Organization, um, having joined the International Olympic Committee and accepted its membership. The problem is that, look, we are now 41 members. We were 42. One had to had, had been defrocked in the sense that the the um, Netherlands Antilles had a referendum at the governmental level, and they went back to the kingdom, and so they were told that they could no longer uh, hold uh, the, the 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 responsibility for national Olympic Committee, and so they had the choice of either going under the kingdom or. In some cases, if you so desire, go under Aruba, uh, Aruba's Olympic Committee. We have been there. We have brought a lot to the table. We have transformed athletics in Pan Am Games. And, and you have, believe that you have the numbers to change the administration at this time? I believe that we, it is not possible for us to change the administration unless we have the support of some of our Spanish colleagues. Okay. Because the voting system uh -huh. is such that those who, for, for, for the election of officers, as well as for the election of a site, those NOCs whose countries would have hosted the Pan American Games have two votes. Everybody else would have one vote. All right. Um, final question uh, before we wrap this up, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we have a piece of graphic here because I know that you've been doing a lot of writing recently, uh, especially in regards to Shafiqwa Maloney, who did so well uh, for St. Vincent and the Grenadines at the just concluded Paris Olympics. And you wrote earlier today, it was posted, um, that while on the scholarship program, Shafi Shafiqwa um, represented St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, once she had completed university and the scholarship ended, she was financially strapped. She began to seek out financial assistance. Uh, countless WhatsApp messages, emails, and phone calls either went unacknowledged, unanswered, or resulted in her being redirected. She acknowledged that while in receipt of some support from Team Athletics and the National Olympic Committee, both indicated that their resources and commitments could not allow them individually and combined to meet her required funding and at the same time honor their respective annual sporting calendars. It was not until Shafiqwa was on Sportsmax where she spoke of her long-standing lack of funding and the video went viral that suddenly there was a sort of awakening at the level of both the government and some segments of the commercial sector that Shafiqwa's plight became the center of attention and financial commitments uh, came forward. I'm just trying to understand the role of uh, the governing bodies that you aspire to be a part of and that you're presently a part of in terms of drumming up the support. Why has that been so unsuccessful over the years where the athletes have to be begging um, to, to get the support? Do you think that it's the body's responsibility or do you think it's more in line with what the government should do? I think it's a bit of both. The, the governing bodies for the sport have access to funding that is provided there by their respective international federations. The National Olympic Committees are in receipt of funding from Olympic Solidarity at the development arm of the IOC and from Pan Am Sports Olympic Solidarity, which is its own development arm for the region. But the funding is such that, for example, the IOC's policy with regard to Olympic solidarity funding is that every Olympic committee, regardless of size around the world, gets exactly the same access to the same amount of funding on an annual basis. There's no discrimination in that. But each Olympic committee has a responsibility to its membership, which is the national federations. The national federations, therefore, make demands on the Olympic committee to divide whatever cake they have in terms of financial resources among their membership. So that it's very difficult for a national Olympic committee to say that it is going to favor one sport over another unless that sport is able to justify that it has the resources in terms of, of athletes 
who will bring more glory and recognition and achievement to the country and to the organization. The challenge in small NOCs is that the pie is never enough. And the, 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 the national cake in terms of resources allocated for sport is also not enough. And therefore, unless you have a policy at a governmental level which dictates exactly how much funding is allocated to sports based on discussions with the national sports associations in the country as to what their needs are on an annual basis, what are the, the levels, uh, the ranking levels of their respective athletes vis-a-vis -vis their international counterparts, what are the chances of them achieving success at the international level, and then determine with those national bodies, inclusive of the Olympic Committee, how we then divide a national cake, then that is what is likely to happen. You quoted my article from today. But last week, the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and was on record at the reception indicating that, look, he thought that we dropped the ball. In a sense, saying that he, the evidence was there that there were challenges in meeting Shafika's needs, and we did not respond soon enough. Why did it take us so long? Had Sportsmax, and he, in fact, commended Sportsmax. He said he was happy that Sportsmax highlighted her plight because it then brought to the consciousness of everybody in St. Vincent and Grenadines where she was in relation to her aspirations and the goals that she had relative to this year's Olympics. I'm saying to you that that should have been obvious because she has been in the news for much of the year um, from, the, well, in, uh, from the indoors um, season right through to the outdoor season. And she has been in the news um, at NCAA for several years. Yeah. And so so, we ought not to have fallen into that kind of trap. Yeah, so Joseph, we have to leave it there. Um, so many questions on that last issue, but maybe one other day we can have another chat and uh, put some of those to you. But thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and we wish you all the very best next week in Paraguay. We'll be looking out to see what happens. And if by Thursday afternoon, you will be president of Pan Am Sports. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, the Vincentian, Keith Joseph, let's rush to a break. After this, we head from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and we're going to be in St. Lucia. Stay with us.